Well, good Wednesday evening. It's good to see you tonight here at Faith Baptist. If you will, take a hymnal, stand with us, and turn to page number 289. There shall be showers of blessing, 200, page number 289. There shall be showers of blessing. This is a promise of love. There shall be seasons refreshing. Set from the Savior above. Showers of blessing. Showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us our falling. But for the showers we plead. There shall be showers of blessing, precious reminding again. Over the hills and the valley, sound of abundance of rain. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round us are falling, but for the showers we need. Sing out together on that last verse. There shall be showers of blessing, oh, that today they might fall. Now as to God we're confessing, now as on Jesus we call. Showers of blessing, showers of blessing we need. Mercy drops round the circle. Welcome to our Wednesday night Bible study and prayer time. I do have a few announcements, uh, but first, the most important one is Hannah Thor is right now at the hospital with Luann and her husband, hopefully, and she's been induced, and we should have a baby in about four hours, so um, pray for her. Uh, also, uh, this Saturday, the Soldiers for Christ and uh, all of those that are going to help us with the house cleaning are going to meet at 9.30 and we're going to have a delicious breakfast and then we're going to go our separate ways and we're going to canvas areas and clean a house. So remember that please. And let's also remember the uh, kids that are at camp. Pray for them as they're there and uh, we'll have a time of prayer. I'm going to switch it around. We're going to have our time of study first and then at the very end we'll split up and pray in groups. I like doing that every once in a while. But uh, we'll pray for them as well at the end of the service. Anyway, it's good to see you tonight, and uh, let's have a word of prayer. Father, I do thank you so much for this opportunity to come together as a family, as believers, and to look into your word and to look at some practical things, and also to have a time of prayer together. Lord, I do pray for our pastor as he's in Ohio and the Brown family. I just pray that you'll have your, your will and your way and everything and every heart there, and that you'd comfort uh, the Brown family. I also pray for our teens as they're gone. I pray that you would comfort them and help them, and I pray that you'd speak to their hearts and keep them safe. Lord, I also pray that you'd be with Hannah right now as she's getting ready to have a baby. I pray that everything will go smoothly and that the baby will be born healthy. And I just pray that you'll bless our time tonight. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, please stand again, if you will, with us and turn to page number 350. Page number 350. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to rest upon his promise. Just to know the same. Just a moment, greet those around you. We'll come back and sing in just a moment on that last verse.
Let's lift it up together on that last verse. I'm so glad I learned to trust Him, precious Jesus, Savior. If you will, turn in your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. Tonight's message, I'm going to go ahead and apologize right from the beginning. It's going to be very practical, um, and uh, of course, uh, it's going to be about missions, <laughs> but I hope it's a blessing. Um, as you can see by the notes, the title of this part one, and uh, Lord willing, we'll have part two next week, is Free Course. And that comes right out of this verse here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. So please don't be upset because we're not flipping back and forth to a lot of scriptures initially. We will wrap it up at the end again with the word of God, and I think you'll understand exactly where I'm going with this. So... Um, we'll start reading in uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 1. It says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified even as it is with you. Let's pray again. Father, again, we ask you to bless this time now as we look to your word and we look at the practical way that this request that Paul wrote many, many years ago can be applied today. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. The word free course here in the scriptures is used 17 times. And the 16 of the 17 times that it's used, it's either translated run or runneth or ran. This is the only place where it is speaking of an inanimate object and it's translated free course to have free course and uh, I think we can see a couple of examples of this word in Mark chapter 5 and verse 6 if you want to turn with me there Mark chapter 5 and verse 6 it says this but when he saw Jesus afar off he ran and worshipped him. The word ran there, the, the demoniac, ran. That's our word that we're looking at tonight. And then in Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8. This was after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It says, and they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. So I think that you have the idea of this word here, free course, to proceed quickly without restraint. And this, of course, is what Paul was asking that people would pray for so that the word of God, as it was being preached and taught around the world, would have free course to proceed quickly without restraint. And uh, tonight, and Lord willing, as I mentioned next week, I want to look at ways that can hinder the free course of the word of God. The Titanic, the RMS Titanic, was a luxury steamship. How many of you have been to that museum there in, in Pigeon Forge? I have not been there yet, but I did go to the exhibit that was at the aquarium a long time ago. It was a luxury steamship, and it sank in the early hours of April 15, 1912 off the coast of Newfoundland in the North Atlantic after sideswiping an iceberg during its maiden voyage. Of the 2,240 passengers and crew on board, more than 1,500 lost their lives in this disaster. On April 14th, 
after four days of uneventful sailing, the Titanic received sporadic reports of ice from other ships. But she was sailing on calm seas under a moonless, clear sky at 22.5 knots. Her top speed that she was capable of was 23 knots. That would be about 26 miles an hour. Is that right, Brother Bob? He's our maritime expert here. So she was almost at top speed, barreling through um, somewhat treacherous waters. At about 11.30 p.m., a lookout saw an iceberg coming out of a slight haze dead ahead and then rang the warning bell and telephoned the bridge. The engines were quickly reversed and the ship was turned sharply. Instead of making a direct impact, the Titanic seemed to graze along the side of the iceberg, sprinkling ice fragments on the forward deck. Sensing no collision, the lookouts were relieved. They had no idea that the iceberg had a jagged underwater spur which slashed a 300-foot gash in the hole 30 feet below the ship's water line. If you're a lover of the Titanic history, like my wife is, you know all about this. The engines were abruptly stopped, and within two hours and 40 minutes, this massive ship sank to the bottom of the sea. Now I'm using this Titanic and the iceberg as an illustration for us to be able to understand one way that we can have a problem with the gospel having free course around the world. Let's look at the iceberg. The tip of the iceberg is very small. It's a small part of the iceberg visible to the eye. The bulk of the iceberg, there's your two blanks, the bulk of the iceberg can be as much as 90% of the berg below the surface of the ocean and unseen. And this, Brother Bob, you can argue with me later, if you, this can be a maritime danger. And it was, of course, the end of the Titanic. So when you see this iceberg out on the ocean, you see this little little mountain peak by comparison, but the bulk of this iceberg, as much as 90% of this iceberg, is below the water. This was the end of the Titanic. Now, by an analogy, culture can also be like an iceberg. Culture can be defined as... Um, all the ways of life, including arts, beliefs, and institutions, and the worldview of a population that is passed down from generation to generation. It's the way of life or the personality of a people. Culture is like an iceberg. The same thing that happened to the Titanic can happen to a missionary as they go overseas. They go overseas with the gospel of Jesus Christ, but little do they know that deep below the surface of this culture can be significant missionary difficulty. And that's what I want to look at tonight. This first part, something that would inhibit the gospel from having free course around the world can be, number one, a cultural breakdown. Well, let's break down culture. The first part of the culture that we see is, and we recognize as we go overseas as missionaries is the doing part of a culture. It's the above the surface part that I mentioned. And this has to do primarily with our senses. When a missionary goes overseas, he goes over and he, he celebrates with the people and uh, he, he recognizes the arts, the painting, the music, the literature, the dance, this is the creative part of the culture. The culinary part, the food. I love to experience new food. Now, I'm not as ambitious as Amber is. She's tried some stuff that I would not try. But I love to experience the food. In every country I go, I want to taste it. I want to see what they eat. Um, 
Maybe afterwards I can share with you what Burhanu ate when we were in Ethiopia with Pastor Mark and I. Anyway, conversation. I like to learn how to greet somebody. When I first get there, I want to learn how to say hello. I want to learn how to say thank you. These are all, these are all parts of the culture that are the doing part of the culture. And these are all the parts of the culture that a missionary, when he goes on a survey trip, or maybe when a missionary goes overseas for the first time, he's experiencing all these things coming at him. And it's very exciting. It's very exhilarating. The doing part of the culture. Celebrations, creativity, the food, conversation. But then there's the next part of the of the culture. You can see um, on the little graph that I put there on the handout, it, it's the thinking part of the culture. This is the part that now you, you start to dip below the surface of the water. You start to dip below, and, and you don't see this initially when you first arrive on the mission field. When a missionary first gets there, he doesn't necessarily see this kind of thing. And this is what begins to cause a little bit of frustration, a little bit of difficulty. We see that this is, this is the mind, the thinking part of the culture, deals with the mind. And it's just below the surface. The missionary must learn how his new adopted people, he must learn how they communicate. And I don't mean necessarily the language. I mean, how does the... How does the people communicate? Do they communicate verbally or do they communicate non-verbally? You say, well, I don't understand that. Um, and it was hard for me to understand when I first went to Samoa. I, I would knock on the doors of people's houses and I would ask them if they were coming to church. And they would say, yes, Brother John, I'll be there. And I'd get back in the car and I'd say to another experienced person who was with me they said they're going to come on Sunday and and the missionary that was with me said no they won't I said what do you mean they just told me they were coming no they won't you didn't read their body language you see in Samoa it's very important for them to put on a hospitable front it's very important for them to speak to me what they think I want to hear so naturally they're going to tell me verbally that they're coming but if you were astute enough in the culture to recognize the body language, you would have known immediately that they'll, they were not going to be there. Learning how the people communicate verbally or non-verbally or linearly or cyclically. We as Americans speak direct. We don't beat around the bush, as it were. We say what we, what we mean, and it's a little bit less offensive here in the South. I've, I've learned that in the South here, y'all are, we're, we're gracious down here. But if you go up north, where I grew up, by Chicago, it's another story. I mean, you walk down the street and somebody go, hey, you're ugly. And I mean, it's, it's that direct and that, that linear but down south, God love them. Bless their heart. A missionary must learn how his people communicate. A missionary must also observe the appropriate customs of his people. There's traditions, customs that are handed down from generation to generation. In Japan, you take your shoes off when you go into a house, period. End of discussion. That's what you do. How many of you wear your shoes in the house? We're, we're kind of mixed. We wear our shoes downstairs, but not upstairs. But if you're in Japan, those shoes are off. Why do they do that? There's reasons, but maybe the reasons are not as clear as they were hundreds of years ago. This is a tradition that's been handed down from generation to generation. There's patterns of behavior. There's greetings. There's personal space. There's gestures. In some countries, um, it's not unusual to see two fellas holding hands, but it doesn't mean the same thing that we would think it meant if we were to see them here in the United States. It's just a different closeness. 
gestures. I remember once I was in the Philippines, and I gestured somebody to come here like this. And Carol Woodley about had a cow. She said, oh, Brother John, don't do that, don't do that. I said, what, what, what? what? She said, that's how you'd call a dog. If you want somebody to come, you'd, you'd call them like this. That's important. I don't want to call somebody like a dog if I want to influence them for the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's, there's traditions, there's patterns of behavior. There's positions and standing within a society. It's important how old somebody is in some cultures. It's important what their gender is. And I know that women's uh, rights is, is a big thing here. But if you travel to, to many countries, as some of us in here have, you'll understand how good women have it here. It's important if you're a man or if you're a woman. It's important if you have money or if you don't have money. It's important what family you belong to. These are all things that a missionary must learn. He must observe the appropriate customs of his people. A missionary must recognize and respect the construction of the society with which he attempts to work. Now you say, Brother John, you've gotten way away from the word of God. This is supposed to be a Bible study. And yes, that's what I said. Be patient with me. We're coming back around. A missionary must recognize and respect the construction of the society with which he or she attempts to work. He must recognize how family works, the place of religion and education and the government within that society. If you notice in the scriptures that the rich man was told to sell everything that he had. The Lord Jesus Christ directly ministered to him according to his status in society. A publican, Jesus Christ said, I'm going to go to your house, to Zacchaeus. He ministered to him appropriately. When uh, the centurion uh, came to the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord, the Lord dealt with him as a soldier because he knew the man could obey and understood authority. A missionary must recognize and respect the construction of the society. And, and the last one underneath the thinking part of the culture is that a missionary must understand how the clock works, how the clock is regarded, again, linearly or cyclically. What's important to your people? Is it deadlines, profits, and losses? That's how we think. Man, i got to have this done. i got to have this in right now, or it's going to be a failure. That's how our culture is, is, it thinks. That's how we operate. Or is it cyclical? Regardless of the time involved, it's more about the relationships, the quality and value that, that your job has to the society. For, for one, it's about the destination. It's about getting it done. And for another, it's about the journey. It's about the getting there. And every people and every country is different. And when a missionary comes to the field, when he arrives, he or she must begin to understand this. That's the thinking part of the culture. There's also the feeling part of the culture. And if you look at the second um, picture I put on the, the handout, you'll see how it goes down, that values are mentioned, that beliefs, values is what is important. Beliefs are what must be so because that's what you believe. Worldviews, we talk about worldviews, but I mean by that monotheistic, are they monotheistic, are they atheistic, are they animistic, are they deist? Are they polytheistic? Do they believe in many gods? Who are they as a people? What, what makes them tick? And then finally, their identity. How does that person identify? When we were in Samoa, there was a commercial that played on the TV over and over and over again. And it, it, they said, we are Samoans. I mean, they were so proud of who they were. 
And if I failed to understand who they were, I would miss the connection. And if I missed the connection, there's no way that I could effectively minister to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you see the Titanic, it was barreling across the waters at 26 miles an hour, almost 23 knots, paying no attention taking no heed to the danger that was underneath the surface of the water. And missionaries have the same temptation. Missionaries can, can get to the field and be so excited about the work of God that they don't do due diligence to study and learn the culture. Now, I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 29. See, I told you that we'd come back to the Bible. Genesis chapter 29, and I want you to see a story that I'm going to borrow uh, from the context. And again, I'm not committing a crime, I promise, but I want you to see the cultural reference here in this story as it pertains to what we're dealing with tonight. Genesis chapter 29, beginning in verse 1. This is, of course, the story of when Jacob first met his beloved Rachel. It says, then Jacob went on his journey and came into the land of the people of the east. And he looked and behold, a well in the field and lo, there were three flocks of sheep lying by it. For out of that well, they watered the flocks and a great stone was upon the well's mouth. And thither were all the flocks gathered and they rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the sheep and put the stone again upon the well's mouth in its place. And Jacob said unto them, My brethren, whence be ye? And they said, Of Haran are we. So Jacob's getting to know these people. He's never met them before. So he, he, he's observing and, and, dis, and beginning a discussion with them. And he said unto them, Know ye Laban, the son of Nahor? And they said, We know him. And he said unto them, Is he well? And they said, He is well. And behold, Rachel, his daughter, cometh with the sheep. And then his curiosity got the best of him as a shepherd. And he said, Lo, it is yet high day. Neither is it time that the cattle should be gathered together. Water ye the sheep and go and feed them. He's like, What in the world are you guys doing anyway, by the way? Your, your cattle shouldn't be anywhere by the well. They should be out feeding on the fields. And listen to what the fellow tells Jacob. And they said, we cannot until all the flocks be gathered together, until they roll the stone from the well's mouth, then we water the sheep. So to them, having respect for their fellow shepherds, was way more important than watering and feeding the sheep. Do you see the cultural reference there? Now, what did Jacob do? Did Jacob stand back and wait for all the other, all the other shepherds to get there? Try to connect with the shepherds? No. It says, and while he yet spake with them, Rachel came with her father's sheep, for she kept them. And it came to pass when Jacob saw Rachel the daughter of Laban, his mother's brother, and the sheep of Laban, his mother's brother, that Jacob went near and rolled the stone from the well's mouth and watered the flock of Laban, his mother's brother. Jacob didn't waste any time. He ran down there, he ripped off the well cover, and he fed Rachel's sheep. Now, I don't know how many shepherds had gathered. I don't know if Rachel was the last one or not, but my point is this. As way, by way of illustrations, many times a missionary filled with passion can behave in such a way that violates customs, disregards status, and runs hardcore into a people's core values, all before taking the time to learn the culture and cultivate long-lasting relationships. And I'm here to tell you, with a few years experience that this creates serious obstacles to the free course 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to the missionary's future ministry. I want you to understand, and maybe some of you know this, the stages of cultural adaptation. The first stage of a missionary, when they arrive on the field, is the honeymoon stage. I mean, they get off the plane. Maybe it's a survey trip. Maybe it's they, they arrive after deputation, but they get off the plane, and they're walking, and everything is beautiful. You can hear them singing, everything is beautiful. You can, I, I got that song stuck in your head now for the rest of the night. You can, you can see them. The people are beautiful. The food is delicious. The, the, the scenery is amazing. This is the life. They had worked so hard. They, they have been on deputation. Uh, the Lord called them probably 10 years ago. And then they had to go to school and study for four years. And then they went on deputation for two to three years. And they're finally here. And everything is beautiful. Everything. This is the honeymoon phase. They're experiencing the culture in only the first 10%. They're only seeing the tip of the iceberg. And everything is beautiful in that little tip. But then the longer they're there, the more they begin to discover what's below the surface. And they enter from the honeymoon stage into the crisis stage. And that's where culture shock begins. Now, some people think culture shock is bugs, snakes, and terrible food. That's not culture shock. You can find that here. There's a spider in my house this week, and I had to eat broccoli. And I'm still here in America. Culture shock has nothing really to do with the discomforts. That's cultural discomfort. You know, I don't want to run, run into a black mamba, uh, but, but that really has nothing to do with culture shock. It's cultural discomfort, the heat. Uh, and whatever I incur physically, that, that's discomfort. But the shock comes when I begin to run into the people and how they think and who they are and, and, and what's in their heart. When I start to experience culture shock, I begin to have acute homesickness, depression, self-doubt, Irritability, frustration, sadness, a sense of failure, recurrent illness, because I've worn myself down with depression and there's new viruses, the bacteria my body's not used to, withdrawal from friends and even activities. That's culture shock. When I experienced culture shock in Samoa, I was numb in my bedroom for a week. I didn't even want to go out of my bedroom. I'll tell you the story because it is quite humorous. The Samoan people, they do not speak linearly. <sighs> Cable TV came to Samoa while I was there, and Bill O'Reilly happened to be on the TV. And when the Samoan people would listen to Bill O'Reilly, they were mortified. How could anybody talk so rudely and so, so straight at somebody? They beat around the bushes. If, if there was something that they wanted you to know, you would not get told directly. You would get told by inference. And eventually you'd get it. Well, I'm stubborn, and I was born close to Chicago, and, and it, it, I'm thick-headed, I'm slow, and uh, I'm working with the kids, and I'm getting frustrated, and I'm running into a lot of these cultural things. And all of a sudden, one of the men of the church come up to me, and he's still in the church today. He's my dear friend. He come up to me, and he said, Brother John? I said, yes. He said, you're really good with kids. And that wasn't a compliment. <laughs> that was as direct as he could say, you're really lousy with adults. <laughs> And that hit me like a ton of bricks. 
and I was home in my bed, in my bedroom for a week. And I had homesickness, depression, self-doubt, irritability, frustration, sadness, a complete sense of failure. I remember praying, Lord, why in the world did you send me here to these people? Withdrawal from friends and activities. That's culture shock. Eventually, a missionary, by the grace of God, begins to adjust. He adjusts by wrestling with God, by gaining perspective and understanding, and by learning the language. Eventually, the missionary begins to adjust. And by the grace of God, within a couple of years, if a missionary is flexible and if he hasn't already gone home, a missionary adapts. The adaptation stage, the missionary is comfortable on the field, he is confident in the culture, and he's content in Christ. This, of course, is the goal for every missionary. Now, wrapping this up, I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter 1, and verse 18. First Timothy chapter 1, and read verses 18 and 19. Paul writes to Timothy, his son in the faith, and he says to him personally, he says, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, when he was ordained, they laid, laid hands on them, and several there filled with the Spirit prophesied as to his spiritual gifts. It says that thou by them mightest war a good warfare. He said, you take your spiritual gifts and you fight like a soldier. Look what he says. Holding faith and a good conscience which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck. We come full circle. Of whom is Hymenius and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. I don't know what happened to these two fellas, but Paul wanted to make sure that it didn't happen to Timothy. He didn't want Timothy to be shipwrecked on the iceberg of culture or any other thing. Holding faith there isn't talking about doctrine. It's talking about quitting and leaving the ministry. Now, we have several missionaries. There was a missionary handout I asked Ms. Sheila to pass out. We have several missionaries on this list that we support and they are going to experience exactly what I just outlined for you very soon if they are not already experiencing it right now. Katie Dilfer, she's on her way soon to South Africa, Lord willing, if her visa comes through. She's going to experience what I mentioned. She's going to experience the honeymoon stage, and then she will experience the crisis stage, culture shock. We need to pray for her. Matt and Melanie Parrott in Bolivia are experiencing this as we speak. The culture shock, the crisis stage, fighting for adjustment on the field. Number 42, Kyle and Hannah Shreve, they're soon leaving for the field and they will experiencing this, this, the stages of cultural adaptation that I just outlined, they will experience at they will it to some degree or another all the way through. Number 55, I'm not going to say his name because we're online. The same thing. Amber, the same thing. Amber, we're on WhatsApp, and frequently we have the opportunity to talk to her. And I, 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 I can say that she is also right now in the crisis stage. And I want to thank many of you who pray for her and of course all of our missionaries and who reach out to her and encourage her because this right here is where they're at and we're talking about the word of God having free course around the world 
how fast will the word of God go around the world if the missionary comes home in defeat? Cultural breakdown. The Grams are leaving this month to Nigeria. I've been to Nigeria. I've tasted the food, and I've seen the place. And I know that when they first get there, there's going to be an overabundance of everything is beautiful. But it won't take long at all before the crisis stage hits. And my whole point tonight is this that we will pray for our missionaries, especially the ones that I just named or pointed out, as far as culture and cultural breakdown, that we will lift these missionaries up and that we will reach out to them via uh, Messenger, Facebook, FaceTime, WhatsApp, the, 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 the numerous ways that we can reach out to them electronically, that we'll support them this way. Next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about cultural beliefs, cultural blunders, and cultural bullies and how they can also stop the word of God from freely flowing around the world. Let's close with a word of prayer and then let's go to our prayer time. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity again. And I pray, Lord, I thank you for every missionary that we have here at Faith Baptist Church. And I pray that you'll take these truths and these principles from your word and that will lift up our missionaries, especially the new ones who are just now arriving to the field. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, I'm going to shift over to the prayer list and I'm going to go over the prayer needs. So if you want to get out your bulletin and mark some things down and then when I'm done, I would mind if you would find a partner or two and pray for these needs that we have here on this list and pray for those missionaries that I've mentioned, especially when it has to do with their growing and their learning, their adjustment to their new field. In our bulletin here underneath the cancer list, we have Tina Faust, and uh, she dealt with breast cancer a couple of years ago and found out recently that it had returned in her lymph nodes. This is Rick and Tina's friend, and I, I, I think we should continue to lift her up in prayer. Um, also pray for our sister Jeanette as she's going to have surgery soon. Um, also on here, um, a little bit further down, is Stephen Reagan. Stephen Reagan is Susan Lindsay's brother, and... Um, she just texted me before we came to the church tonight and said that her brother was dismissed from the hospital, but he went home with hospice care. So continue to pray for her brother. Um, his name is Stephen Reagan. They're on our list. Then over here to physical and other needs, um, I would ask you to continue praying for Nikki's mom, Linda Davidson. Um, thank you so much for your prayers for her. Stage three renal failure. And also for um, Willow Reese. Hopefully, uh, Willow will have a heart within six months, but her heart is too weak to go home, so she'll stay in the hospital until she gets a transplant. And then um, another one that Brother Terry gave me is this girl named Bella. I believe she's on our list as well here underneath physical and other needs. Bella needs to turn to the Lord and in the process of all this, um, you can see what it says there. Uh, she was in a severe car accident, and she fractured her spine. So we pray that the Lord will use this to get her attention, that she will turn to the Lord. Um, then over to recovering from surgery, um, we have Diana Houston, um, breast cancer. She's recovering from surgery. And Tony uh, Jarmus, Brother Frank's brother, uh, also recovering from surgery. And then underneath bereavement, um, we have the Gabby Andrews family. Gabby died on Saturday with an aneurysm. She was 19 and would have turned 20 this past Monday. That's tough. Um, they're the friends of the Childers. Um, also, Debbie Williams' family. 
Um, she also died Saturday from a long battle with cancer. So pray for the Debbie Williams family. And then the Roger Satterfield family. Uh, Roger passed away Sunday, and the funeral service was tonight. Uh, this is Jerry Roach's, Brother Roach's brother-in-law. So pray for the Roger Satterfield family. And also for the Rosemary Bryant family. Um, and also, of course, uh, our beloved brother Joe Brown and Jeremy and his boys and, and uh, Floyd and Gloria and his brother Pat. And, of course, Pastor Mark as he's there right now uh, getting ready to, to minister to them tomorrow at the funeral. If we would pray for these families. Um, I also have on this list here uh, to pray for Susan Lindsay's friend, Tom. Um, Susan asked us to pray for Tom. Tom lost his son about two and a half months ago, and she asked us to pray for Tom. Uh, I got to meet Tom. I just happened to meet them at Walmart and uh, pray for Tom. Also, Brother Terry handed me this. Um, pray for Kay Watts. This is Jean LeCoultre's daughter-in-law. She had a seizure, and um, they need to find out the cause as to why she had a seizure, and we also need to pray for her salvation. Pray for her salvation. Um, on the back here is our missionaries, and uh, we'll pray for the Childers. They're back working with the grief share right now, and uh, we'll pray for Brother Terry as he continues to get the training school all set up at the end of this month. And then, of course, uh, Brother Terry and I would greatly appreciate you praying for us as we go to jail or prison. I also pray for Jason and Kate Christensen uh, as they seek God's will as far as the next um, development in their ministry, where God would have them go. He's got some opportunities that he's investigating and praying about. So just pray that God would give them wisdom as far as where the Lord would have them go and uh, Anna is getting married soon, and Paul, pray for Paul to get adjusted here in the States, their son Paul. We want to pray for Johannes and Kittis in Zambia. We want to continue to pray that those barrels that we sent would get there safely. And, of course, the deaf churches that he has and the several deaf churches that are there that are, um, that are without pastors. Johannes does a wonderful job of, of training and he also sends them to a vocational school, uh, maybe teaching or something like that, so that when they are ready to be in the ministry, they can provide for their own families and minister the gospel. Uh, Johannes is just doing a wonderful job. Pray for that deaf ministry. Also pray for Leah, too, as Leah comes over here. I'm not sure exactly where she's at, either Seattle or San Francisco, somewhere over there where she's getting ready to go to school. She wants to be a doctor. So pray for Leah as well. Continue to pray for Amber as she uh, learns the language and, and grows in her understanding and adap adaptation of the Filipino culture. And uh, Nikki and I appreciate your prayers for us. And then also pray for Burhanu and Wubit and the prospects of getting that land here very soon and the building that is to go up on it. We also listed here on the bottom of our prayer list, Sean and Kristen Evans. Remember, we're praying for um, their son that had the broken arm, ulna, and radius bone, and, and then their daughter, Cameron, was diagnosed, guy, uh, I can't talk, diagnosed with a congenital heart defect, which may require a pacemaker. Let's pray for the Evans family tonight as well. And then John and April Flowers, pray for four ladies, they asked, Cindy, Annie, Mary, and See Gia Loon. God brought to our church two of which have never heard about Jesus. And then let's pray for Dorothea Francis. Pray as she continues to minister to the deaf in her church. I don't know if I did that all in the right order as Pastor Mark would, but there's a lot to pray for. And we have time to pray for it. So let's take that time and let's pray for these needs on the missionary list that we have, and let's pray for these missionaries, especially the missionaries that are new that I mentioned. Pray for them that they will be able to grow in their understanding of the culture 
and that they will not be the cause of the word of God stopping, but that the word of God will have free course through their ministry as they grow and find themselves completely content in Christ and confident in the new culture. Um, let's gather together with who and whoever and how many ever you want to pray, and then when we're finished, we can quietly be dismissed. Thank you.